basic Dungeons and Dragons, like all no-brainers, took a very huge brain to come up with. John Eric Holmes was not like most of the people in the D&D world. He already had a career as a professor of neurology at the University of Southern California, but the man was also a huge nerd. After his brief stint with D&D, he'd go on to spend a decade trying to get permission from the estate of Edgar Rice Burroughs to write a novel set in the universe of the Pellucidar novels. However, when he finally succeeded and released his first novel, permission was unceremoniously taken away for the two sequels. He'd already written one of the sequels. The second novel was held by the estate for 44 years, 12 years after he died before finally being I was going to say, released. Yeah. is he still alive? No. no. So that so there there was plans for novels two and three, but then... He wrote novel two, but he, he never wrote, wrote two. two, three. But before <sighs> two even came out, it yeah. was put on the back burner for 44 years. Gee, why bring it back after that point? I, I guess, imagine like... at that point they just wanted to make some quick cash, I yeah. guess. The man was a true blue nerd. He was also a huge gaming enthusiast and designer. He enjoyed Dungeons and Dragons, but he saw a huge opportunity to expand its influence by drawing in a wider group of players with simplified rules. He later wrote in Dragon Magazine number 52. When Tactical Studies Rules published the first Dungeons and Dragons rule sets, the three little books in brown covers, they were intended to guide people who were already playing the game. As a guide to learning the game, they were incomprehensible. His goal was simple, take all the most essential rules and organize them in a way that made sense to read. This novel concept would continue to elude the mainline books well into second edition, which is perhaps why Basic was such a smash hit that at times it even outsold Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Holmes's version of the Basic rules became an on-ramp for millions into the hobby, and his name was forever immortalized by it. And then we move on to the accompanying adventure module, a simple two-page adventure called In Search of the Unknown written by Mike Carr. Mike Carr originally met Gary Gygax at the first Gen Con. When Gygax later formed TSR, Mike Carr was asked to join the team. He was a prolific editor, editing all three of the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons core rulebooks, as well as many of the most famous adventure modules of the era, such as White Plume Mountain, Village of Hamlet, and Keep on the Borderlands. He was also a friend of Dave Arneson which Gygax was not above using. At this point, Arneson's lawsuit was looming large over the company. Gygax argued that Arneson should only get royalties on the basic edition of Dungeons & Dragons. Then, by having Arneson's friend write the adventure module, he ensured that Arneson's lawsuit for a greater share of royalties would directly impact his friend rather than Gary Gygax. However, Gygax was not prepared for how explosive the growth of D&D would be after the incident with James Egbert. And so, with the basic rules selling like gangbusters and Mike Carr getting a handsome royalty on each sale, Gygax had unwittingly signed away a huge money-making opportunity. Whoops. Arneson did win his lawsuit eventually and secured his royalty, though TSR would continue trying to screw him out of that royalty using the basic advanced divide for years to come. During this period of explosive growth, a great deal of fresh talent flocked down to Lake Geneva to join the team. An integral early hire was Lawrence Schick. Lawrence Schick was the writer of one of the greatest funhouse dungeons ever written, White Plume Mountain. A funhouse dungeon was a particular style of dungeon where a great deal of improbably elaborate traps were strung together to create farcical and mentally challenging adventures. Even so, Lawrence managed to balance the absurdity with a clear story. Lawrence was, and is, a natural-born storyteller. So much so that when his time at TSR came to an end, he was hired on by games companies almost immediately. Eventually, this led him to Zenimax Studios, where he was the head writer for The Elder Scrolls Online for 10 years, before retiring to go work on Baldur's Gate 3 with Larian Studios. And for the entire duration, he has always maintained his love of actually playing these games, often organizing extremely elaborate LARPs of 50 to 100 people. This man is an absolute legend. That outfit is goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I imagine that's one of his LARP costumes. Maybe, or maybe. Listen, if you live and breathe <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons, that mm -hmm. might be your everyday. Tom Moldvay was hired by Lawrence Schick when the company was growing rapidly in the late 70s. He was tapped to rewrite Gene Wells' Silver Princess article and publish several additional adventure modules. So they rewrote the whole event, like mm -hmm. rewriting it because of the art. Correct. Um, Not just getting different art. Yeah. Eventually, he was tapped to revise the basic rules in 1980. 
His revision is widely praised for helping to further formalize the rules, while also expanding several areas of the book, including a lengthy list of books which could be used as references for D&D. Moldvay would later say that for him, the basic rules were the superior introduction to D&D. They allowed you to come up with the rules on the fly when needed, rather than trying to be comprehensive. It seemed like many agreed with him as Basic continued to perform exceptionally well, and any adventure attached to the Basic set became an instant classic by virtue of being sold with the most sold D&D product. He truly must have loved the process of honing the rules down as far as he could, because in 1986 he released the Challenges game system, which streamlined the rules of AD&D down to just eight pages. He eventually left games publishing for health reasons. Of course, with this edition of the basic rules, Gygax included Keep on the Borderlands, an adventure he had written. He wasn't about to let that royalty slip him by twice. During these early days of TSR, one artist was quickly emerging to establish the style of TSR art, Errol Otis. He first submitted his work to Dragon Magazine, drawing a blue worm monster. He was surprised a few weeks later to see his monster published as a new monster stat block called the Rimaraz. Apparently, they'd used it without ever even contacting him. After that, he got in contact with TSR. He began to get contract work, which evolved into being an in-house artist for Dragon Magazine and the D&D Adventure modules. His unique style is, in my opinion, a testament to his strange blend of influences. He claims he was heavily inspired by Dr. Seuss and Frank Frazetta. Frank Frazetta was already, by this time, a famous fantasy artist and was popular for making covers to sword and sorcery novels with big, muscular men fighting heroically to protect beautiful, half-naked women. Frank Frazetta is a genuine legend, and his legacy is way bigger than D&D. His art directly inspires the Conan films and the look of sword and sorcery basically forever. He's also going to inspire almost every artist who works on these books. But the whimsical art of Dr. Seuss is, in my opinion, a perfect complement to that. Errol Otis's art is terrifying, monstrous, but also whimsical and imaginative. It has a dreamlike quality that makes D&D monsters just a little bit silly, and D&D, as we are all well aware, is also just a little bit silly. This mix of terrifying monstrosities and vibrant dreamlike colors and shapes creates an aesthetic that is unique to D&D and gives it its own identity. But working for TSR as an artist wasn't always so great. Artists who produce art for a project effectively have three revenue streams. One is the original contract, the money you make when you sell the product to the client. In this case, TSR. The second is prints, money made from reproducing the art at a lower quality at a lower price. Generally speaking, these are sold at conventions. The third was to auction off the original for a large sum if the art was particularly popular. But TSR kept all originals of the art that was submitted to them. This meant that there was no way to auction off the original and there was certainly no way to make prints. For guys who frequented conventions, they had to know this was screwing over their artists. And from what I've read, the artists complained about it several times. The management just didn't care. Brian Bloom's father, Melvin Bloom, sold all his shares to Brian Bloom's brother, Kevin Bloom. Kevin had joined TSR to help run the business side of things. Quite suddenly, Kevin went from a minor employee to a co-owner of the business, a member of the board, and the second biggest shareholder in TSR. And suddenly we have two Blooms and one Gygax at the top. Kevin Bloom was almost certainly the most qualified person of these three to run a large business, but that really isn't saying much. For a year, they entered a strange stalemate called the Year of Three Presidents. On paper, Gygax was the highest ranking president, outranking both Blooms in the organizational chart. But he answered to the board of directors, as all CEOs do, and the board of directors was him and the two other Bloom brothers who both outvoted him with controlling shares. As such, who really answered to who is a big mystery for both the employees and for these three. During this boom period of first edition and basic, the sales of TSR kept going up, but the revenue stagnated and eventually began to stumble. TSR was spending money as quickly as they got it. They acquired several companies, and this is sort of what businesses do as they keep growing. They try to acquire things that are going to help them make more money. But their acquisitions were somewhat suspect. Simulation Publications, Inc., an RPG company with a significant amount of debt that TSR had now acquired, they also acquired Amazing Stories, which was a purchase which worked out way better. It was a sci-fi literary magazine that they often tapped to help with publication for the dragon. And finally, a needlework company called Greenfield Needlewomen. Reportedly, this purchase was motivated by Kevin Bloom's wife asking him to support her hobby like she had supported his. Hmm, that's a questionable reason to acquire a business. 
TSR hired aggressively during this time, growing to 180 employees in 1981, and then doubling that by 1983 to 312 employees. With the company growing rapidly and anxiety increasing about who was actually in charge, TSR decided to finally put the matter to bed. TSR was split into TSR Inc. and TSR Entertainment Inc. Gygax had an idea in his heart for a D&D movie. He'd seen Conan the Barbarian, and he hated it. He considered it to be an affront to the novels that he had loved so much as a child. He imagined that he was the only person who could get a D&D movie done right. He took leadership of the entertainment arm of TSR and began to rent a mansion in Hollywood where he desperately shopped the D&D brand around, trying to find the right partners for television and film. Can we stop for a moment and appreciate the fake baller energy of renting a mansion? Yeah. The man didn't even go full narcissist and buy one. He rented. <laughs> kind of sad. <laughs> that explains where all the money went, I guess. Yeah. Gygax had no real hand on what was going on back in Lake Geneva. Here at the height of the TSR era, where hundreds of young, talented people had flocked to him and his gaming company out of love for the hobby, Gygax had completely left it behind. He was fully addicted to cocaine and equally addicted to extramarital affairs. His home life was growing more and more toxic. He and his wife were harassed out of their church over the game, which surely put a strain on their already strained relationship. He had been a devout Jehovah's Witness his whole life, and, and now he had lost a critical tether to his home. Perhaps a good reason to run away to Hollywood. He made acquaintances with a man by the name of Flint Dill. Dill's family had actually published the Buck Rogers comic strips and still owned the rights to Buck Rogers. Dill would go on to write for Hasbro brands like G.I. Joe and Transformers, so he was a bit of a writer already. Dill helped Gygax run TSR Entertainment and helped with at least one draft of the film script, which Gygax promised would rival Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark in quality. Apparently, he spent his days courting Orson Welles for the role of the film's villain, which apparently Orson Welles had actually agreed to at one point. Gygax publicly announced he expected TSR to make around $75 million in 1983. They had grown aggressively to prepare for that. In reality, it made around $26.7 million. Good times for Gygax and TSR were coming to an end. It was all the mansion. That was all the mansion. <laughs> Clearly. A forty-five million dollar shortfall is um tough pill to swallow. <laughs> yeah. When when your founder is off goofing off in Hollywood. Now we move on to my favorite segment of the program, where we get to look at your adorable character. You know, first impressions. How'd you feel? You know, in uh, in this edition. I it was so much easier <laughs> to j just find anything at all. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, not jumping around. I didn't have to jump around between three books uh, and ask you like, "Hey, can you go check this other book for this other thing?" While I try to find it in the book that I'm actually looking at to try to make my character. Yeah, um, I mean, I feel like this was. I feel like the the actual rules didn't really change that much i feel like we were following oh, the same rules it's just that we understood what we were doing yeah like even with like finding the stuff for like mm -hmm. saving throws and oh my god the weapons not to mention how they explained adjusting stats so clearly in this yeah. versus the last time where we just had no idea what we were doing yeah oh my god yeah i i i've Every time I do this, every time I, I, I do this every couple of years, I go through all the old editions and I make characters in each edition just to kind of remember what it was like and to familiarize <laughs> it because I have a real genuine interest in the history yeah. of D&D. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> um, but every time I get to basic, I feel like such a oh, sigh of relief. <laughs> I've, I've, I've reached a period where things make a little bit of sense. Oh, yeah. We're we're about to go off the deep end a little bit in the creation of characters. Like char character creation is about to become a lot more complicated, but at least going forward, I don't think it'll ever quite be as frustrating as it yeah, was. Yeah, basic is like an oasis mm -hmm. compared to uh, yeah, uh, and it is advanced. an oasis in in many ways. Like, I mean, I genuinely think that the rules of basic could be sold today as a game. Like, I think that there are some kinds of people who would play this game even to this day. Yeah, I, I feel like I could hand the rule book to my dad and he would understand. Yeah, it. I mean, it just really, it really, like, it takes all the things that are good about this first version of the game, the, like, simplicity of character creation, 
the simplicity of like characters and it just distills it all down and lays it out neatly and it's good to go. Um, so let's take a little look at the character this time. So uh, in this version of the game, races are classes. So yes. your class is dwarf. Yes. Um, which was very interesting. Uh, I think that was one of the things that you had like the most difficulty Kind of wrapping was. your head around, <laughs> and I don't, I don't know if it's something that I would have mm. difficulty with if I, like, if I didn't play D anD D before, like, if I was coming into it new, uh -huh. you know. But like after playing, you know, Dungeons and Dragons for like five, six years, like it just, it's really weird for my class to be dwarf because usually I try to. You know, when I make a character, I usually try to think about, okay, like, like who, what would this character's occupation be? What would they do? What fits the most? Mm -hmm. And then it's just like, nope, I, it's dwarf. And I'm like, well, that doesn't tell me about who they are, you know? <laughs> um, we rolled really, really, you yeah. rolled really, yeah. really well on the stats this time. Speaking of rolling in, and, you know, they, they did simplify this one as well. Instead mm -hmm. of, you know, roll four, drop the lowest. Um, it was just roll three, D6. It was just like uh, the original version, yeah. yeah. This is very much a descendant of original D&D. Yep. Whereas advanced is kind of a reinvention of the wheel, so to speak. Yeah. This is a direct descendant of OD and D, so it follows all the rules of OD and D, including three D six in order. Mm -hmm. uh, although it does have the courtesy of letting the player roll their own stats as opposed to having yes. the DM do it. Yes. Um, Which was nice. I got to use my dice. Yeah, yeah. It's it's good. Um, but yeah, stats you rolled are amazing. Strength fifteen, int ten, whiz fourteen, dex fifteen. Con 12, Charisma 11. You took two from Wiz and gave it to Strength to bump yourself up to that 16 Strength benchmark. Because that's good for dwarves. Yeah, it gives you a 10% EXP bonus. Um, I think it is also the plus two to hit and plus two to damage Yes, correct. Well. Uh, I, think, I think at 15 it would have been plus one yeah. on both of those things. Yeah. Um, and then your Dexterity gives you plus one to hit with missiles, so having a 15 Dex is great. A minus one AC, which is awesome. Oh yes, it is. Um, uh, and then your Charisma gives you a little bit of, uh, like, your charisma is just okay. At the, in this version, 12 is basically the sort yeah. of, like, no, modern, like, moderate. Uh, not good, not bad. Um, yeah. You rolled a 5 on HP, uh, and then your AC is 3. Uh, you have... Uh, with the leather armor and a shield. Yeah, and then we can, it? No, it was chainmail. It was chainmail. We can look here with your saving <laughs> throws, uh, which I think are amazing. Uh, at a certain Dwarf's point, got just a bonus. tired of writing, you just started drawing instead. <laughs> uh, I yes. wasn't gonna write out dragon breath. That takes up so much space. I could just draw a green noodle and be done. I honestly, the one thing I really don't understand about this edition of the game, right? Like, it feels to me that dwarf is only advantages over regular fighter. Because, like, you get, you know, obviously infrared vision and noticing traps and passageways. Yeah. And your saves are better, <laughs> yes. but fighter like regular fighter is just regular fighter. It doesn't give you anything. I I guess your weapon selection is slightly more varied. Uh, there's no two handed weapon on dwarf. Um, oh yeah, it literally doesn't let you. You are you are too small to use a two handed weapon. Yeah, and also I think like long bows. But I, honestly, yes, giving no that up bows. for better saving throws and infrared vision feels like a no-brainer to me I especially because like... isn't the death ray one like insta death too yeah Something yeah like that yeah. yeah yeah i like being better against that yeah exactly right like it feels really just solid i don't know i think i i, I just can't imagine playing a normal human if this is an option um yeah. you spent your gold again uh which is very true to the edition uh, so you got two daggers, a hand axe, a normal sword, sword, commas, normal. <laughs> yes, yeah, sword, comma, normal. Um, chain mail, backpack, flask of oil, 50 feet of rope, one week of rations, 10 foot wooden pole, tinderbox. Which is uh, like more than two times the size of my character. So I'm very <laughs> curious about where this pole is. Yeah. Uh, torches, water skin, wolf's bane. Uh, I had extra gold. You you had to consult your GM for a price for items not on the list. Fine comb. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> oh, it was originally for beard, and uh -huh. I don't have a beard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, your hair is still quite luxurious, so yes. you still need it. Um, And then sling 30 stones. We love to see it. It needed um, a ranged option. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, uh, the cheapest one. <laughs> your damage calculations are down here, obviously with your plus two from your strength on some of oh, them. The plus then, two is beautiful, yeah. And then that plus one from Sling, feeling really good about all of that. Uh, and... Not all the ranges listed because mm -hmm. I didn't, don't need it. Oh, that. and we didn't go over this. Your character's name is Sumeri, <laughs> uh, which is because you asked me what should I name this, and then I said the word summary out loud. Yes. And and I, you I, just, I went with we it. You're like, okay, that's the name. <laughs> that's the name now. Uh, which, you know, I won't take responsibility for this. <laughs> I refuse. <laughs> no. um, okay, so what is your one major takeaway from this edition, I guess? Well, like, if you had to, like, uh, everything we've talked about, everything you've thought about in your time here with this game, like, what's the one thing you're sort of carrying away? I think the one, I mean... It honestly for me it was that i the fact that i could not get over the fact that dwarf is a class an elf is a class <laughs> yeah like mm. uh and because it, it's you know before you could be a dwarf who was a fighting man or yeah. magic user right um but it's like it's, nope and it's kind of true in like od and d in a roundabout yeah. way it is true that like what a elf was in OD and D was a person with both fighting man and yeah. magic user levels, and that's what they are here. It's just a class that combines both. Yeah. But just like the the structural change of breaking them out into their own class really does make this feel like a different evolution of the game. <laughs> like, yes. and that holds true through all the other versions of Be of, of basic too. So like. Uh, we're about to do Beck Me next, um, which is the next ev evolution of Basic. Uh, and then eventually they do the Rules Cyclopedia. We're not going to cover that, but the Rules Cyclopedia also uh, has, you know, Elf as a class. Uh, uh, I think they add Half Elf to the list of options as well. Um, but yeah, so it, it definitely gives it the feeling of a branch of evolution yeah. of this game. And I think, I think also part of it, because I, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, nowadays with Tasha's, you know, customizable lineage, it's like, okay, I can be a, you know, a dwarf magic user. You can't be a magic user mm -hmm. as, as a, because your, your class is dwarf. You yeah. cannot be magic user. And it's like, well, can I not? Can I not yeah. Oh, we almost didn't do it again. What's my grade? Oh, what's the grade, grade for my book report? Oh, B for basic. B for basic. <laughs> uh, I feel like you I phoned... mean that's what this version is. I feel like you phoned that one in. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I did think of it earlier at the beginning when mm -hmm. you said, "Oh yeah, you didn't grade me last time." Mm -hmm. I was like, "Well, this time's B for basic." So I can't <laughs> use a B. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope you will tune in the next time for another episode. Uh, until then, it was a pleasure hanging out with you again, Iloff. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye.